as you've seen in your bullet and insert, we're looking at 25 verses. I do not want you to be panicked by that. You cannot tell this story without reading all 25 verses. Uh, but despite Brian saying we were going to be here for two hours, uh, we, we, were, we are going to be here for two hours, but maybe doing something different. But we'll try to move this right along. We've been in this series of miracles. We've been kind of setting the biblical foundation for miracles. Now we want to look at some miracles. And uh, we're going to look at uh, basically four different types today. We're going to look at conversion miracles. And truthfully, if we all think about it, you're going to hear this again a little bit. All conversion is a miracle. The fact that we've never seen, heard uh, from Jesus, we just heard about him from others. We've seen about him ex it, uh, being evidence in other people's lives. Uh, and we're going to find out how important that is. We came to a place where we knew we needed to give our life to Christ, whether it was as a young child or whether we were older, uh, no matter what we're at in our life. Ultimately, it was the word of God that was spoken. It was the witness that was been given. It was the examples that we saw and those, the hope that grew us. Ultimately, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us in to that relationship. So we pick it up in Acts chapter 9. Going back to an area that I know that we uh, looked at when we went through Acts, but let's go back and look at this again, and it's worth noting. Acts 9, verses 1 through 25. Now Saul was still uh, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, and he requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that he might find that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked or said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will, uh, you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and, through his eye, and, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and, and ask for a man from Tarsus, named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on the name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plot. So they were watching the gates day and night and intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him into a lar in, in a large basket through an opening in the wall. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this account of Saul's conversion. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the life of Saul who would become known as we know more as Paul today and the impact that he had in this world at that time and is still influencing the, uh, the world today not only through his personal testimony, but through his letters that were inspired by you and, and stayed for us by you so that we can learn how to live and walk in Christ, that we might 
do so with the same boldness that Paul did, with the same fervor and zeal that Paul did. So Lord, I just pray now that you open up our minds and our hearts to hear about you at work in the life of your people, and especially as it begins with conversion. And, and as, as we learned just a little bit earlier from Alan, Father, we are so grateful for the blood that was shed that we could be completely forgiven of our sins and to live righteously unto you. So Lord, I pray now that you'll bless this message, your messenger, and those who are listening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We want to jump right into this. I just want to remind you the purpose of miracles. The purpose of miracles is for God to reveal himself and that we would know that it is God and that he has either a word or a purpose for us in doing that miracle. And if we're talking about conversion, we can just simply say it is bringing us back into relationship with him, that we would come to a place where we understand who he is, that he is the creator of all life, that he is the sustainer of all life, and that by providing salvation through Jesus Christ, we can be made right with him. We have the promise of eternity with that, but he also calls us into that, and the purpose for us is to be in service to him. But quite honestly, it's a miracle that takes place. Now, if I know there's different people that you're going to look at, uh, those who know April and I our whole life, not a miracle that she's a follower of Jesus, where she grew up in church. Some look at me and they go, man, that's amazing. You know, uh, in fact, I think I still have people calling, reaching out to see if I've really actually died uh, from my wayward life before. And then they find, and they find out what we're doing. They're just absolutely shocked and amazed. So, uh, but I think, again, all conversions, no matter what the story is behind it, we're going to find that out. Uh, and I'm jumping the gun here a little bit, but let me just say it now. When Paul started proclaiming in the synagogues, he didn't go back and tell this story. That wasn't the only one. He wasn't a one-trick pony. In fact, he didn't even start from then. Truthfully, he didn't have to. That story spread abroad by itself. But Paul didn't base a whole ministry on that. He would base his apostleship on that. He would say, I am an apostle because of the encounter I had with Christ on the road to Damascus. But in this case, when he starts proclaiming, he is lifting up one name only, that is Jesus. He's not lifting himself up, not pointing to him. He is lifting up Jesus because Jesus is, has to be the hero, right? Man, you've got, you've got people joining you, Chuck. This is good. We're, we're gaining momentum when it comes to that. So let's look at this. Verses 1 through 9. You know, we, uh, it was a great time with uh, the Pierce, Pierce, Alan Pierce. I keep wanting to say Pearson for some reason, and him leading us to the idea of the story. And so we're going to retell this story a little bit using some of that principle, not exactly. But I want us to just walk through the story quickly to see exactly how miraculous this really took place. You know, we first are introduced to Saul at the stoning of Stephen, and uh, he held the cloaks of those who st stoned Stephen. He, he was uh, committed to the Jewish faith. He was committed to, his, his, uh, to the law. He was, he was faithful, and he really thought that what he was doing was defending God by trying to persecute and root out this new a sect that was growing up that was called followers of the, of the way. Later, they would be called Christians. They weren't called that till, uh, in Antioch. But here, they were called followers of the way, those who were calling upon the name of Jesus. And Paul was so committed to this. And after the stoning of Stephen, he went to the high priest. He got papers from them that allowed him to have the authority to go to other cities and find men and women who were calling on Jesus, who were uh, those of the follow, uh, followers of the way, and he was going to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. And who, who knows what the plans were from there. He chose Damascus because it was an important city at that time. It was a big city. And, <clears throat> and he could also take the papers from the high priest. And because they were so connected, it would be easy for him to extradite those people from that city. You know, we become territorial. And even though we've got somebody making claims against some of our folks sometimes, we're going to keep them. But here he had the papers and Damascus would have allowed him that opportunity. We need to know that it was about a six day journey for them. Uh, Damascus was about 175 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And so by foot, it would take them about six days. I want you to know that Saul had a good, strong plan in place. He was well organized. He had the people. He had the papers. He had the support. But don't you just love it? when God has a different plan. 
I just love it when we, we've got all these plans, all these strategies. And let me tell you, even at the last hour, because Saul's encounter with Jesus was just before he got to the city. Remember, it's a six-day journey, 175 miles. Now, if you're Paul and you've planned this and you want and you are you're zealous about it, I mean you're gonna defend your Jewish heritage and faith. The whole time he's walking, he's thinking, How can I do this efficiently? How can I do this better? How can I get rid of them? And I just can see the fervor growing within him, maybe even the anger that this is this is happening. And he's nearly to Damascus. He's almost there. So he's had about maybe at least five days, if not more, of really just ramping up for this. And all of a sudden, he encounters this bright light on his way. Now, because uh, Saul was a good Jew and he knew his, uh, his faith, he knew that having something like this, it, it was midday, so it's the middle of the day, so it wasn't just something that he saw in the sun, but a light, and, and a supernatural light, he would have known immediately that this was a message from God. And he stopped, and he encountered that light. And... I just wonder, now this is pure speculation on my part, did he think that God was about to bless him? God was about to affirm what he's doing? So I'll thank you for taking up this cause. I will be with you each and every step of the way. I just think about how surprised he was when he heard the voice of Jesus. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's going, hmm. And out of respect, I believe with great reverence, because he knew at that point who he's talking to, he said, who are you? I'm not persecuting you. Lord, the last one that I would persecute you, I've come to defend you. I'm taking up your cause. I'm going to rid the world of this, this group that is going to draw us away from you. And Jesus has said, why are you persecuting me? He didn't really give him much more than that. But Saul knew who it was. He heard the message, and Jesus simply said, and before Saul could go any further, really, he was blinded, and Jesus just simply said, what I want you to do is go up, go to the city in Damascus, wait there, somebody's going to come that's going to give you back your sight and tell you what to do. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if it was that easy for us? I'd love to have that kind of miracle. Jesus, just show up and just tell me directly, or send me somebody that we would know. But as this happened... And as Saul uh, experienced this, and despite being even blinded in the event, in spite being aware in the fact that he was out persecuting, indeed, the one whom God had sent, he got up and was faithful and obedient, and he went to the city. And I love what he did when he got to the city. He didn't just go there and sit down. What he did is he went there, and he prayed, and he fasted. He wanted to truly know what this was all about. I just got to believe how confused he was, this devout, zealous Jew, this, this, uh, this leader of the law, he was so committed to it, he's got to be thinking in his mind, how did I get it so wrong? But he didn't live there, he didn't stay there, he didn't stay in that pity. What he did was he sought the Lord and said, okay, what do you want to do? And even in that, he says, look, the guy's going to come, his name's Ananias, and when he comes, you're going to regain your sight. I mean, he has just poured so much into Paul. This, this is just such an, a, an amazing conversion experience. And it's only made more amazing to me when we look at verses 10 through 18 that we have now on the hills of that, what I call the obedience of Ananias. And honestly, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. Obviously, this is someone that has come to faith in Christ. He's a follower of the way. He's committed, and God knows that he can call on him. Jesus knows that he can raise him up and send him to be the messenger who's going to help Saul get his beginning and teach him. And he goes to Ananias, and he says, what I want you to do is I want you to go uh, to this person, Saul of Tarsus. You're going to go. You're going to go to this place called the Straight Street, and you're going to look at this house, and it's going to be Saul of Tarsus. I so want to uh, get in there with uh, some of my more charismatic brothers and maybe African-American brothers when we get to this Straight Street and go down this whole road. of good. He didn't say the crooked street. He didn't say the, the curvy street. <laughs> he didn't say the dead end street he went to the straight street right all right i love that right straight to jesus is what we want to do i'm telling you what you could have so much fun with that but we won't do that today what we're going to do is we're going to come back is that ananias hears this word he knows he's specific about which house he's got to go to what street it's on and who he's going to see and what he's going to do and what's ananias's response uh 
heard of him. Lord, uh, just to remind you that he's a dangerous man. He's looking to find people like me, arrest people like me, and take us to prison in Jerusalem. Lord, are, are you really sure about this? And he was reminding God as if God didn't already know. Now, that's a natural proclivity, isn't it? That's just natural. I think all of us would be like that. God's calling you to get up and go to a dangerous place. I can just only imagine some being called into the mission field, as Alan was challenging us last week, to go to some places that are desperate and dangerous. You really want me to go? I really like the comfort here. I like that I can get my eggs in my backyard, and, and we can live in, in relatively safety. You guys will get the eggs in the backyard thing later. But anyway, it is comfort, and we become comfortable, and we become safe. But you know, God's going to call us, and he's going to send us. And sometimes it's even to our neighbor that we might think might be a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. But we have to get to the place where Ananias, even though he questioned him, even though he wrestled through that, even though it was hard for him to do, he trusted the Lord. If we would but trust the Lord, really, truly trust him with great confidence, we would move like Ananias did, and Ananias went, and Ananias went with boldness. And, and this is where we see the confirmation of Saul's conversion come together and take place. Saul's conversion is going to be uh, established here in this encounter with Ananias. Now, we would understand it took place on the Damascus Road. The fact that Saul uh, uh, submitted to uh, what he was being told, he submitted to the, the message from the Lord, from Jesus, and he went and he waited. But we get this confirmation here, and it's great that we get this confirmation that all of us will have it. You know, the bottom line is proof is in the pudding, right? We can say all we want all day long about, about who we are, what we're doing, and what's happening. But if it's not evidenced by the way that we're living out, it means nothing. So in these verses 18 through 22, we find out Ananias went to meet with Saul. Uh, Saul was prepared to receive him because he'd already been told about this in a vision that Ananias was coming. But I love what happens here right at the get-go. When Ananias gets there, he says, Brother Saul. That's no small greeting. Ananias, even before physically meeting Saul, has embraced him as a brother because of one thing only, the Lord told him so. For us, that's the kind of trust Ananias had. And he embraces Saul in this very personal, intimate way, and says, I am recognizing you as being part of the Christian community, as a brother in Christ, as one who is going to name Jesus as Lord and Savior. He embraced him as a new brother. And Ananias then went on to say to Saul, I said, this Jesus who you met on the road, this Jesus has sent me to tell you that your sight will be refilled, or, or regained, and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened. When that took place, when, when Ananias made that comment, when he made that statement, uh, scales from uh, Paul's eyes fell. He regained his sight. He was baptized, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But I like this next part. And they let him eat. All right? They had a potluck. I think that's why we have so much. So much happens around the table and around food, doesn't it? It's good to eat together, but he needed to be refreshed, not only spiritually, he, in fact, not refreshed, he was reborn, he was born again, he was made new spiritually, but they knew also that he had some physical uh, needs that needed to be met, and so they gave him the uh, nutrition that he needed. He was, he was a brand new man, he was, he was uh, uh, born again spiritually, emotionally, and now physically, all of this is happening, and what does Paul do? Saul, excuse me, he's not Paul yet. What does Saul do? He goes to the synagogue and starts proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the synagogue that he loved. This is the synagogue where he spent his time. This is the synagogue, maybe not, not that particular one, but this, any synagogue where he would teach, where he would learn, that he, would lo that he loved. In fact, it was that very institution that he was going to protect in taking care of this new group, followers of the way. 
And it is there that he went and he made the declaration. And it is the amazing confirmation of his life when he stood in the midst of his fellow Jews and said, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one we must follow. And even though it was an amazing confirmation of a convert life, it comes with a cost. And we find that in verses 23 through 25. The persecutor becomes the persecuted. He was going daily teaching. And the Jews who thought he was coming to help rid their city of this, these new Christians, he now joined them. And they were getting angry. But I don't want you to see why they were getting angry. It says that as time went by, as the days went by, and as he was teaching them, he was confounding them. You know why he was confounding them? He was preaching the truth. And they didn't want to hear it. It does bring back echoes of the movie, right? Uh, it was a few good men. You can't handle the truth. And they really couldn't handle it. They were so ingrained in their institution, in their way of life, in their heritage, in, in what they believed was owed to them, that they could not see that God had sent them the Messiah. And, and Saul was making the case in their midst, not only did God send the Messiah, his name is Jesus, and this is the one we've been waiting for. And he had so much proof, and he had so much proof in the Spirit. I just believe the Holy Spirit that I believe these Jews were angry, not so much at what he was saying, but because of the conviction of what they were experiencing in their own hearts. The rustle that was taking place, they wanted, they wanted to keep what they had, and they weren't willing to surrender and let go and embrace who Jesus was. And the only thing that they could do, and they knew to do, because they couldn't come against Paul, they couldn't beat the truth, they couldn't speak against what he was saying, they were going to do just what the Pharisees and spiritual leaders did to Jesus. They were going to kill him. Let's just get rid of Let's just cut it off right here. Let's just kill him. And so they plot to kill them. But I also like this. In a short period of time here, and we don't really know how long it said. It just said he was there for some time. It says Saul's disciples. Now, let's be careful there because all disciples of Jesus, right? But it is those whom we are influencing, those we are teaching, those we are mentoring, those whom we are pouring our lives into, sometimes they will be considered our disciples. That would have been language they would have understood that day. And it was his disciples, those who had come to faith in Christ, those who are starting to grow in their walk in their faith with Christ, they came and they helped him to escape. And why is it escape in the Bible? Old Testament, New Testament, you've got to be let down in a basket through an opening in the wall. As the only way to get out. But they did that, and he escaped. And I want us to understand that this conversion was indeed miraculous. I mean, when I first knew that I was going to do conversion miracles, this, uh, you have to go to Paul, right? I mean, there's others that we could go to, but, but he's probably one of the most well-known and most dramatic conversions that took place. But as I've already said, it's been well said by many that all conversions are miracles. You know, we need to express faith in someone that we've never seen or heard. But yet through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the influence of others in our lives, the scales can fall from our eyes and we do believe. And I'm amazed at myself sometimes, and I know what it took for me to get saved. And, I, and, and really, I think it was a miraculous uh, conversion as well. All the events that took place and how God used those and a group of people praying for me I didn't even know was praying for me. And I come to faith in Christ, I start to grow in Christ, but then I hear about others coming to faith in Christ, and I go, really? Are you sure? I mean, don't we question it? And if we, we just stop long enough and consider what it is that God has done in our life and what he is doing, that should remove that judgmentalism from us. But I will tell you that I've had it <laughs> over the years. In the book, Eric McCaskis, and you know that's what really started this whole thing with me about miracles, he talks about this, and he makes this point that we sometimes are skeptical about what people say. And truth of the matter is, I've shared this with you before. A, a friend of mine, he was a pastor in the association, uh, uh, John, he, um, he often would get asked, is so-and-so a good Christian? And he said, I don't know. Let me live with them for 10 years, and I'll let you know. Now, that's probably not going to answer the question whether they're a follower or not, but are they a growing, practicing follower, disciple of Jesus? 
And, and it does take that, but when, even when people show evidence of it, we still hold them in suspect. Uh, Metaxas in his book, he recounts the conversion of people like Chuck Colson. How many of you remember Chuck Colson? Part of the whole Watergate affair, spent a great deal of time in prison, went and was converted, uh, and just went on to do incredible work for the kingdom. Uh, but then we get into some other ones like David Berkowitz. Anybody remember that name? Son of Sam Murders. These are the people I don't want to get saved. That's the other thing I wrestle with. They don't deserve it. Oh my gosh, can you believe we say things like that? I mean, how can they be? And yet, I'm going to be honest with you, there's times where I'm like, when I hear those stories about those guys getting saved, I'm like, almost doggone it. I'm getting better at that. And I'm rejoicing over that. Because the impact of somebody like him, Sam Berkowitz getting saved, and his testimony, his life, has such great impact and influence for the kingdom. And I think will bring peace ultimately to some of those who have experienced the, the uh, atrocities by his hand. But the story that really caught my attention was that of the conversion of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is an interesting character. We all love, or I shouldn't say we all love, I love C.S. Lewis. We like C.S. Lewis. Chronicles of Narnia is one of our favorite stories to continue to go back and read over and over again. But it took a lot for C.S. Lewis to become a believer. Uh, in fact, Metaxas tells the story, but C.S. Lewis even writes and tells his own story in a little book called uh, Surprised by Joy. I recommend you reading it. But he talks about at a young age, Lewis said, you know, I had this earning, I, I had this deep longing for something that was beyond myself. And he knew there was something greater, and he wanted to find what it is. But his childhood was not a good one. Lewis's mother died when he was nine. And part of that was he had prayed for her, for, for her healing, and she, and she wasn't healed, and she died, which then moved him in to where his dad was his sole uh, care provider and sent him off to all of these boarding schools, and it was just a tough life for him. He, 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 and he just became more and more disenchanted with the idea of God. And it really took place when he went off to what we call the Great War, World War I. And then being in the trenches and experiencing the bombings, the gassings, and even seeing the death of a very good friend, in fact, his closest friend, it just hardened his heart towards uh, what he was longing for as a child. It hardened him from really continuing to pursue trying to find that which was greater in the person of, or in God himself. And so what he did is he became what he calls a confirmed atheist a confirmed atheist. He would go on to say he's not exactly happy about being an atheist, but he thought, what other answer could there be? What other choice could there be? I can't, I can't continue to live in these empty feelings thinking there's something greater, but never seeing it happen, never experiencing him in my life. And so he just became totally disinterested in God. But one of the things that he was interested in were in myth. M-Y-P-H-S. I had to look, check my spelling, because I have a hard time saying that, myth. All right, so now you guys know when I'm saying that what I'm talking about. And he especially liked uh, the stories, the Norse sagas, you know, Vikings, things like that. He resonated with them, and I, again, he didn't recognize, but that was his need to be a part of something bigger, something greater than himself. And where it really came to fruition and what it started to open his eyes, he met a guy by the name of J.R. Tolkien. You guys know who that is? Lord of the Rings series, The Hobbit, great series. Uh, Tolkien, who was a devout Roman Catholic, uh, they were students together while they were at Oxford. And it is through the conversations between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien that he moved from being an atheist to what we call theist. He believed in theism. He was willing to say, okay, I believe there's a God, but he doesn't have anything to do with us. He's not participating, he's not acting, he's not entering into our lives. But he was at least willing to go there. He wrote a, a letter to a friend of his, Arthur Greaves, and he said, I gave in in a minute that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in England. He really was kicking against this. He didn't want it. But as I continued these conversations, and it was on September 19th, that it is recorded, 1931, about one or two in the morning, uh, him and Tolkien and another friend of theirs, Hugo Dyson, they were out uh, walking as they normally did, had these conversations, great discussions. Tolkien suggested to Lewis that the story, now hang with me as I say this, just hang with this idea, right? Because a myth is nothing more than what? A story. It's an accounting. But we also have attached it to, they're not true. They're not real. 
crystal token in trying to unlock this for uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, he suggested to Lewis that the story of Christ dying and then rising from the dead was indeed a myth. It meets all the criteria, right, of what a hero would be to be raised. But he goes on to say, just as the stories of all those young gods who died and then rose from the dead were also myths, but he suggested to Lewis that the myth of Christ was also true. You see, it's that word true. It's that word truth. Just like Saul, when he stood and proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue that confounded the Jews and they became so angry, is because they were met with truth. And I only think through the power of the Holy Spirit can that happen. And with, with Tolkien saying that to Lewis that night and saying that, the, that these other myths that we read about are not true, this is the one that is the one, only one that is true. That did something within his heart. That did something that, that changed. He, when he said that this actually happened, and he said this is why he believed it, and he encouraged Lewis to think about it as well. It was something that Lewis had never considered. And he asked the questions, could it really be true? Could it really be? But there was enough evidence for him to at least consider it. And he had some other people in his life that were influential, and, and he thought about this. He saw if the brilliant G.K. Chesterton, uh, whom he admired, believed in, if the great writer George MacDonald, whose stories he so admired, had believed it, he must at least consider it as well. Here's the amazing part. The conversation is, nine days later, him and his brother... I have trouble saying his name, so I'm not going to say it's Wainier or something like that. I mean, who names their kid that, right? But anyway, they decide to go to the zoo. And so his brother drives a, a motorcycle. He's got a sidecar. He goes by and picks up Tolkien. They've got a little bit of a drive. I think it's like an hour or two to the zoo where they're going. And it was in that drive that C.S. Lewis says, I became a believer in Jesus. He said, I not only at that point believed the truth, I accept the truth, and I give in to the truth. He, he says he doesn't know if it was a conscious decision, but he says somehow it happened. He said he just passed from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ and in Christianity. This was a major thing for him, but again, the miraculous part is he can't really tell you exactly all that happened to bring him to that point. He just knew it did. And we know it did because he went on to have a great influential life. He wrote books on apologetics such as Mere Christianity. He awakened millions to the rationality of the Christian faith with his books of fiction and fantasy, like the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, he raised us to the idea of the imagination and creative side of God. And it seems after all, after these two sides of faith came together in Lewis' conversion, he spent the next decades of his life sharing both of them with the world. All miracle, purpose, service. I think this is what God's doing. Walter Hooper, who was Lewis's secretary through that whole time, he says this about Lewis. He is the most thoroughly converted man I ever met. His journey from atheist to reluctant convert to influential writer, perhaps the most highly regarded Christian writer of our time. It was something beyond his imagination. I think that's why, and I put this quote on your outline, John Piper says, Christian conversion is a supernatural, radical thing. The heart is changed. And the evidence of it is not just new decisions, but new affections, new feelings. And I would even add to that new action of how we live our lives. And we love to talk about these guys, and we love to tell their stories like Saul about C.S. Lewis, about Chuck Colson, because they're dramatic, right? But I want you to know your own story is dramatic. Somewhere in your life, God came to you, drew you. No one comes to the Father unless he draws them. And through an encounter with his word, with the testimony and the evidence of other people's lives, you became a believer. You became a follower of Christ. You knew that it was truth. Not anything we wrap our hands around, we can't touch, we can't feel, we can't taste, we can't smell, but we know it's true. I'm telling you, only the miraculous where that can happen. It's, it, it, our conversions are supernatural. We need to trust, we need to believe, and we need to know that God has done this. 
and he's entered your life, and you're here today because you say, I'm a follower of Christ. When he's entered your life, he has saved you. One, because he loves you. We get that right from the beginning. But he has a special word for you. And he's got a special purpose for you. And what he's looking for from us is our trust and obedience. And let me tell you one of the reasons why. There's others around us that need to hear this truth. And just like it took others in C.S. Lewis' life, like Tolkien, like Chesterton, like McDonald, these people need us in their life, being the example that we can of what it means to be changed so radically. And I want you to just consider for a moment what kind of person you would be if it wasn't for Jesus. I didn't like this part of the preparation for the message. I know i got to wrap it up, but I want you to hear it. This week, God has shown to me that if I wasn't a follower of his, that I wasn't submitted to him and his will and his purpose, I'd be one of the most angry guys in the world. And I realize I, I carry anger a lot of times. Now, thankfully, God keeps it down. But it shows itself. Whenever I see injustice, which I should get angry about, but it's the kind of anger. You've heard me talk about my road rage. Uh, you talk about when we don't get things that we want or things don't go our way. I know there's some proclivity within me I want to be angry about it, which only leads me to be a victim about it. And that's ultimately, and that's the kind of person I know I would be. And I don't think you guys would know me as an angry person, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully you've never seen any of that. That's only because God keeps that and, and spares me from that. And, I, and I'm not angry. I don't feel like a victim in all of these things. But what I am amazed by God lets me remember that piece of it to know just how much I have been rescued from. Because that's not the kind of life. I want to live a life of abundance, joy, knowing he's touched me and he's made me whole. So consider for a moment, what kind of person would you be if it had not been for the miraculous salvation that Jesus has done in your life? Let's give him thanksgiving for it. And then let's live it out with boldness, with fervor, with zeal, courage and confidence, complete trust in him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this uh, understanding of what you did in Saul's life and the others we mentioned. And Lord, let us reflect today on what you've done in our life and what you have rescued us from. Lord, so many uh, paths we could go down in our lives that could just, just lead us to ruin. Father, you drew us to you. We heard your word, and we responded. Lord, now we get to live that life of joy, peace, love, abundance. Father, may our lives reflect what you've given to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.